Physics Notes, Unit 17, Part B. Some of the math and a few more terms. But one thing that's true about sound is that the warmer the air is, the faster sound travels. Not by much. And vice versa, the colder the air is, the slower it travels. Bottom line, it's because when it's colder out, the air particles are already moving slower, so it takes a bit longer for the vibrations to transmit from point A to point B. But here's the basic equation for the velocity of sound in air. The velocity of the sound wave is 331 times the square root of the temperature over 273. Now, the temperature T here has to be in kelvins. And the conversion is 273 degrees Kelvin is 0 degrees Celsius. And that means, well, that's freezing. That's the freezing point. So if you're at 0 degrees Celsius, all right, then you're at freezing. You're at 230, 273 Kelvin. If you put that in this equation, 273 over 273 is 1. The square root of 1 is 1. So the velocity of the wave at 0 degrees Celsius, freezing point, is 331 meters per second. It comes out in meters per second. Those are the standard units. I should have put that here. It's going to be the velocity of the waves in meter per second, the, the velocity of the sound wave. Those will be the standard units here. And so therefore, bottom line is over here, if you know the temperature in Kelvin, or in Celsius, Kelvin's what you want. If you know it in Celsius, you have to add 273 to get the Kelvin temperature. Here's some examples. Plus, it has some review down here. It says, what's the wavelength of a 512 hertz note sung outside on a day when the temperature is 28 degrees Celsius, which is pretty warm? And because room temperature is 20 degrees Celsius. But bottom line is, first we have to do this review question. Wavelength equals velocity equals wavelength times frequency. Well, actually, that's, that's the last thing we have to do. We're going to figure out the velocity first. So the, the velocity of the sound wave is going to be 331 times the square root of the temperature, but we got to add the 273 to this to get our temperature in kelvins. So that's what? 301? 301, 301 degrees kelvin. So that's our T in the equation. 301 is the T divided by 273. So the velocity will be 331, and the square root of, uh, well, 301 divided by 273 is 1.10. So that's the square root of 1.10. And you take the square root of 1.10, multiply it by 331, and you get the velocity of the sound, in this case, is 347 meters per second. 347. Uh, at, at, at room temperature, it usually comes out to be like 343 or 344. You can double check that. But we're not done yet. That's the velocity of this note. So it's a little bit faster. I mean, it's enough faster to make a difference from certainly from zero degrees Celsius, but also from typical room temperature, which is 343. Not a big difference. But we know the velocity now is 347. So I'm going back over here. 347 equals, we're looking for the wavelength, lambda, times this uh, frequency, 512. So it's a pretty easy computation at this point. This comes out in standard units because everything is standard, meters per second and hertz. That comes out to be, uh, let's see what that is here. Hang on. And it comes out to be 0.68 meters, which is 68 centimeters would be the wavelength of that particular note. That's a C. Uh, it's the middle C is 256, so it's the next octave up. Next harmonic, we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. All right, so what's the temperature if the speed of sound is 338? All right, so we're just going to, this is kind of a backwards version of what we just did. So it's 331, whoops, 331, 331 times the square root of T over 273. So you plug in 338 equals 331. This is pretty straightforward. Times T over 273. Divide 338 by 331. You get 1.02. 1.02 equals the square root of T over 273. I'm going to go down the page here. 
square both sides. Square both sides to get rid of the square root, you get 1.04. 1.04 equals t over 273. Multiply both sides by 273 and you get t equals 284 Kelvin. 284 Kelvin. All right, if you want that in Celsius, you subtract the 273. You subtract the 273. It's a fairly cold day. So, or cool day, minus 273 gives you 11 degrees Celsius, which is about 52 Fahrenheit. That's roughly 52 degrees Fahrenheit if you're more used to that, which most of us are. Um, all right, so those are, those are pretty straightforward. The nice thing about this chapter is it's pretty straightforward what equation you need to use for which problems. All right, here's a new concept, Doppler effect. You've probably heard of this before with like radar. They use this concept to um, track weather systems and tell you if it's raining or not. Uh, but in the more formal definition here, it's, it's a, an apparent change in the frequency of a wave, wave due to the motion of the due to the motion of the source or receiver of the wave. Okay, all waves can exhibit the Doppler effect: sound waves, light waves, water waves. But it's most commonly demonstrated with sound waves, and I like to call it the race car the race car example. I couldn't really find a good video, but the race car example. And I always do this in class live, and my students usually make fun of me, but this is my impersonation of a race car. Eum! Eum! Okay, so uh, here's the idea. It's a change in the, the frequency of the actual sound that's being given off by the car or the object. Or to say it another way, okay, when something's approaching you or you're approaching something, if two things are getting closer together and one of them is making a noise, a sound, let's take a steady sound, like a car horn or a car engine noise, like a race car. Right? So that's that's a race car, that's my race car example. When they're getting closer together, all right, they're approaching each other, you're you're perceiving a frequency that's higher than the actual note of the car engine or the car horn. And when it goes away from you, the, the second it passes you, or when two things are separating, you hear a lower pitch than the actual frequency that is being given off by that car or object. And it, this could be for light as well. This is used in uh, astronomy for what they call a red and blue shifts, because a blue shift is the higher shift, because blue light's higher frequency, red is lower frequency. So the analogy in, in light would be if two things are coming together, this is how they know, like, well, if the, if the universe is expanding, if two things are getting further away, like if they look at a star in a telescope, and it looks white to our eyes, but if they analyze it and it has a reddish shift to that star light, it's got a red shift, that, that red is a low shift. It's a lower frequency than, than the other frequencies. So anytime you have a lower shift down here, the lower shift means that things are getting farther apart, that star is moving away from us. But for sound, if you have the low pitch, that means it's moving away from you. And I mean, sound is the easy one to, to, to illustrate here. I'm going to show you a video here in a few minutes, but this kind of this kind of shows you a little bit of what the video will be about. You know, if a car, this car, if this car was not moving at all, all these circles would be concentric and not bunched up in the front here. But what happens is when the car moves, it's giving off a noise because the car is moving and the sound is moving. The, the sound waves, these, these circles, these semicircles, represent sound waves that are kind of bunching up in the front of the car. So if you were standing here as a person, not right in front of the car, by, but by, by the side of the road, uh, these sound waves would get to you and they'd be, they're, bu they're bunched up more. There's a higher frequency of sound waves, so you hear a higher pitch than you normally would if the car weren't moving. And once the car passes you, when you're standing back here, the waves are spread out, so you hear the lower pitch. If, you weren't, if the car weren't moving at all, you'd hear the standard pitch of the noise. This over here is for like a sound, uh, for a, a boat or a, an airplane. Uh, and this one's kind of going, the, the airplane's going to the left here. And let me, let me show you the video and then I'll talk more about this. Okay, so what we have here is, over here this is going to be a, a source of a sound wave. You're not going to hear it, but you'll see it 
as circles coming out of this source over here. Here's a person. They're going to turn the person into a dot. So let me start this up. All right, so hopefully it starts up. Okay, so they turn the person into a dot. There's going to be some sound. So that circle represents sound, a certain frequency. So the person over here is now hearing a sound. They're hearing the, the actual frequency that's emitted. There's no bunching up. Whatever frequency this is, 300 hertz, that's what they're hearing. So there's no Doppler effect. But now what they're going to do is they're going to start the the source, this thing right here, is going to start moving to the right. All right. Or you could have the person move to the left. Now, this is just a review of wavelength. So it's the typical wavelength, typical frequency that the person is receiving right now. Now, here we go. They're going to start moving. Hopefully soon here. All right, so now it's moving. The, the Well, they paused it. Okay, so now it's going to... So it, the, the source will be moving. And they're going to say, okay, we have the velocity of sound as V. All right, they're, they're using C for the velocity of sound and V for the velocity of the, the moving object. I'll have this. I'll have an equation written down in your notes here. Right now, the velocity of the object is one half the speed of the sound. And, and like sound in air is like 300, you know, 30, 343 meters per second. But okay, so here's the idea. As it moves, so the as the sound source moves to the right, okay, it's kind of catching up with the waves. Not completely because the waves actually are still faster than the so the source. The source is half the speed of the sound, but you get this bunching up. So the person over here now receiving it is going to receive a wavelength that's less than it was before, but a higher frequency, a smaller smaller wavelength, but a higher frequency. So the perceived frequency you receive is going to be higher. It's Doppler effect. There we go. And then, if you don't crash, if you go past, once you go past, then you'll be hearing, I'm, I paused it, you'll hear a lower frequency, because you have a bigger wavelength, lower frequency than perceived. That's the whole race car thing. Okay. Don't confuse it with loudness. It has nothing to do with loudness. Race cars get louder when they get close to you as well. But um, it has to do with frequency. Doppler effect is all about frequency, not loudness. Now, here's a case where... I'm going to stop it for a second. The velocity of the sound maker is the same as the speed of sound. So, for example, if the speed of sound is 343 meters per second on a standard day, if the source is traveling at 343 meters per second, like 770 miles per hour, the sound waves are all right bunched up. That's And it's a lot of constructive interference here, there. There's also another name for it. It's called the sound barrier, so to speak. Uh, there's not really a... Well, there's there's some physical turbulence there. If it's an airplane, it's trying to make, break the sound barrier. And by the way, the speed of sound, when we talk about airplanes, 770 miles per hour, 343 meters per second, it's called Mach 1. And... You know, there's some military aircraft that can go faster than that. Most commercial airplanes don't go that fast. They go like 500 miles per hour, um, through, you know, 250 meters per second. But anyways, so you have this sound barrier here. Let me keep going here. So it's an extreme Doppler effect. And we're going to go a little bit further with this. Once, you, once your source actually goes faster than the speed of sound, you have a real interesting effect, and it re relates to sonic booms or to a wake behind a boat. A wake behind a boat is really just a two-dimensional situation of a sonic boom behind an airplane. So now it's going to say, okay, the source of the sound is going to be faster than the, sp the source of the sound giver, V, is going to be greater than the speed of sound itself. The speed of sound, they're using the letter C there. You don't need to know that. So now it's going to start traveling to the right. Oh, they're going to make sure you don't crash either. And now we're going to make believe this is an airplane over top. It's an airplane going up above our heads. Or it could be a boat in the water. I'll give you that example as well. So here we go. It's an airplane going overhead. And now they're going to then increase the frequency to kind of fill it in to show you uh, more of the shape here, what happens. Because where these white circles, these are like crests. And where the white circles intersect, you get constructive interference. So bottom line here is, the end game here, the airplane in this case, or if it's a boat in water, so this could be a boat in water, all right, and you have a wake behind the boat. And if you've ever been in a boat, if you've ever been in a boat, 
you don't see circles like this, but you'll see a V shape. You'll see along this line right here and along this line right here, you'll see a V. That's called a wake. And you get a wake if you go, I mean, like 10 miles per hour in a boat. That's why if you've ever been in a boat before, they have these places called no wake zones because a wake can be very disturbing for people who are trying to swim or, you know, trying not to drown if you're swimming in the water. But that's when you get near the shore, you have a no wake zone. But if you get out into the open water, you, that's, you know, you, you, uh, you want to go fast in your boat. I mean, you want to get someplace or it's more fun to go fast. You always get this wake. It's a V shape. So it's two dimensional. It's constructive. What it is is constructive interference. They call it a bow wave for a boat. I'll write this down in a minute. And then if you're water skiing, you water ski back in this area behind the boat. And it's kind of fun to jump over the wake. And sometimes they have this thing called wakeboarding now or yeah, wakeboarding where it's just a fun thing to do if you're skiing, if you've ever done that, you know what I'm talking about. But now, this would be the overhead view for a, for a boat, for looking down at a boat in the water. This would be the side view for an airplane. If this orange thing is an airplane, and this is you on the ground, this is the side view. And this V shape is the loud sonic boom. And the misconception is that a sonic boom only occurs when the airplane goes past the speed of sound. What's true is once the airplane exceeds the speed of sound, it continually has a sonic boom following it. And this person hasn't heard the sonic boom yet. You might be on the ground, the airplane's way overhead. All right, people back here on the ground, so the ground would be like along, if I drew a line here horizontally. Back here, these people already heard the sonic boom. You're just about to hear the sonic boom. You've already seen the airplane pass you, and you're going to hear the sonic boom. And the thing is, <clears throat> the closer to the ground you are, the louder it will be, because it's also true if the airplane's really, really high, the energy actually dissipates. The sonic boom is not that loud. It can't break windows and stuff like that. But if it's really low, it can actually hurt your eardrums or break windows. If the airplane's really low, it's a really, really loud sound because it's constructive interference following the airplane at all times after it's past the speed of sound. So they call it a shock wave, sonic boom. For a boat, they call it a bow wave or a wake. So now they're just kind of shading in to show you that that's the, the shape. For an airplane, it's conical. It's three-dimensional. For a boat, it's two-dimensional. It's a V-shape behind, behind the boat. And it turns out that there's actually kind of two simultaneous shock waves behind an airplane because of, because of the front of the airplane. There's a picture in the, in the book. The front of the airplane is generating a shock wave, sonic boom, and the back of the airplane is the just doing the opposite. It's a high and low compression, compression rarefaction. So you kind of get a but it happens so fast, it sounds like one big shock wave, one big sonic boom. I'm just kind of showing you here, like this house right here is about ready to get the sonic boom. That house, here's the uh, sonic boom. People over here haven't heard it yet. Like if I'm over, I don't know, there's another house coming up here. Oh, no, there wasn't another house. But All right, so that's sonic booms. So to put a few of those things together, this could be an overhead view of a boat where this V shape would be the wake. And the faster the boat goes, the more narrow that wake is. But for an airplane side view, that's the sonic boom. Down here, I call it sonic boom. They call it a shock wave. It's three-dimensional. For a boat, they call it a bow wave, two-dimensional. But it's interference. It comes from constructive interference. And this is Mach 1. Here's where the airplane is going, the speed of sound. And you could have Mach 2, and then you have a the more pronounced. Well, this would be maybe Mach. Over here would be Mach 2. This is subsonic, not going as fast as the speed of sound. So another thing, another way to look at this is that the uh, sonic boom and the bow wave behind a boat are basically extreme examples of the Doppler effect. We have this, you know, very um, big shift in frequency because of, well, it's just because you've exceeded the speed of the waves. It's... Um, I say an extreme verse, extreme case, extreme case of the Doppler effect. Doppler effect, though, you don't get the interference because the waves never actually interfere. They're still not overlapping each other like they are if you go beyond their speed. Okay, so that's oh, here's another picture of this is the picture we ended with on the um, the video where these people over here are by these houses. If you're by these houses, you haven't heard the sonic boom yet. If you're back here, it kind of shows you a nice three dimensional view of the cone. Along this black line is where people standing on there are hearing that sonic boom right there at that time. It also turns out that when airplanes do exceed the speed of sound at that particular moment, the sound barrier, because of all the turbulence and the compression of the air, you get this cloud, this interesting cloud 
of condensation because of the different the change in temperature at that point and the, the large um, well forces involved and so forth and speeds and temperatures the uh, you get this little burst of clouds as the airplane passes the speed of sound it's kind of interesting you can watch videos on that as well so like I said popular misconception sonic boom follows uh, is at one time only um, it, well the con misconception is that that the sonic boom only happens as the airplane breaks the sound barrier. In actuality, it's following the airplane at all times. That's the real thing, okay? The misconception is it's only a one-time thing. No, it follows the airplane. Um, and like I said before, the higher the airplane is, you might not hear a real loud sounding boom because it dissipates when it gets to the ground because it's so far away. Um, and when you see the airplane, you'll see it pass you for because sound travels faster than a light travels faster than the sound you'll see the airplane before you hear the sonic boom all right these are the equations for Doppler shift for sound all right and I'm going to apply these right now the uh, the two things that, really, that are really kind of important to keep in mind as we apply these things because there's like some pluses and minuses you got to keep track of here when something is approaching you whether it's making the sound or you're making the sound, okay, not you, but the observer. Let me say it again. Something is approaching you that's making noise, okay, or you're approaching it, it's making noise. As long as you're coming closer together, okay, as long as you're getting closer together, you are going to perceive a higher frequency than typical, than the actual frequency. If you're going apart, okay, whether the sound maker is leaving you or you're leaving it, okay, if you're getting further apart, the frequency will be lower than the actual. So here's some examples. I'm going to uh, apply that to these equations here. Uh, I'm just going to talk about the equations as I solve the problems. For example, in part three, or question three, what frequency is received by a person watching an oncoming ambulance? So an ambulance is giving off a steady 820 hertz sound from a siren. You're a stationary observer. So what you got to do is find, you got to pick one of these two equations. So you got to pick the one. You're a stationary observer, and the source of the sound is, is coming towards you. Okay. Um, the second case is where I'm doing another problem like that in a minute, where you have the stationary source of the sound, but you, the moving observer is either moving towards or away from the sound. You'll see the difference. In case three here, problem three, the source, the sound maker is moving. That's why I'm picking this equation up here. It's a little bit different. So the equation up there, I'm going to write it down. So I wrote down that equation up there because it said, the main thing here is, is that the observer, the observer, me, that's receiving the sound, the person, is not moving. The sound maker is moving. Okay. Then I also had to pick whether it's plus or minus. So how did I pick the minus here already? The minus is used in that equation. It says that up here in the literature, in my notes. Uh, use the minus when the two things are coming closer together, when the sound maker is moving towards you. If it's moving away from you, that'll be part B. Then you're going to put a plus there. That'll be part B. What frequency does she receive if the ambulance has passed her? And the, so it's going away from you. Then we'll put a plus in there. It'll change the answer. So I, once you have that right equation, it's just a matter of putting in numbers in. It's pretty simple. That's, once again, it's one thing nice about this unit you know you're, it's asking you for a Doppler shift. Once you have the right equation, it's just a matter of plugging the numbers in and doing the algebra. So I'm going to plug the numbers in. Okay. So I plug the numbers in, but I also noticed that the, the ambulance is 115 kilometers per hour. It's pretty fast. It's like over 60 miles per hour. So I had to do the conversion over here. 115 kilometers per hour times 1,000 meters in one kilometer. That gets rid of the kilometers. And then uh, that gets rid of the kilometers. And then one hour, 60 minutes, that gets rid of the hours. And then one minute, 60 seconds, gets rid of the minute. So it comes out to be 32 meters per second. You should be able to do that. You don't even need to show the work for that. You can if you want. But that's the velocity of the source of the sound. That's what the S means here, V sub S. That's why it's 32. Once again, the minus is because they're coming together. It's what it, in that equation uh, for the moving source of the sound, stationary observer, uh, if they're coming close together, you got to use the minus of that. You just got to remember or have that in your notes, which you will. The 820 is the actual frequency of the source. 
that's the sound it's giving off if you were just sitting there by it or if you're in the in, in the ambulance that's what you hear and now the rest is just doing the math which I'll do here so yeah I erased all that um, conversion work but basically just did the math 345 minus 32 is 313 345 divided by 3 divided by 313 is 1 point something multiplied by 820 gives you 940 Hertz all right now part B we have to use the same equation but put a plus right there I'm gonna do that so I finish this off I also fixed this answer it was I think what I have 940 it was wrong something wrong there but so I fixed it. it's 900 it's like a 903 or something like that but I rounded off to two sig figs so the middle zero there would be significant but that's good enough 900 if you put 903 or 904 I would take it hurts then over here you just change it to a plus so it's 345 plus 32 which is 377 345 divided by 377 is 0.9 something times 820 so the observer the person standing by the road now will hear the low frequency that the low frequency pitch after it has passed you this is a siren not a race car but all right now let's do it for the uh, the moving observer stationary source so we got to use the other equation all right let me write that one down so I've written it down I mean I already told you that this is the equation you're using but how do you know which equation to use well maybe you read the question maybe you didn't but it says there's a person in a car traveling towards a sound source so there's a stationary sound source like on a pole or something like that I don't know it's a 210 Hertz source gives you the speed of sound in this particular day uh, if you don't know the speed of sound you have to calculate it or to be given the speed of sound or what the temperature is like we did previously so in this case though it's going to be the velocity of the wave here's the equation it's plus or minus here so how do you know which one use plus or minus so the first thing is to get which right equation there's basically four equations there's two of these and two of the others but how do I know to use the plus you just got to memorize it or got to look at the notes it says if they're going towards each other you use the plus so it's the opposite of the other one in part a if it's the stationary observer then you and they're going towards each other you use the minus here if you have the moving observer okay stationary source of sound use the plus so that's a little tricky there and then the rest is just plug in the numbers and uh, let's do that and what makes this one a little bit different is that we're looking for the velocity of the car the observer the person in the car so we know what the uh, received frequency is we know the the, uh, the the actual frequency of the stationary source and the velocity of sound was given 335 so now we have to do the math here and what I would do is divide both sides by 210 divide both sides by 210 you get 1.09 1 1.09 1 .09 equals 335 plus the velocity of the car over 335 I'm just gonna do the math now so you can multiply both sides by 335 so you get like 350 something here uh, 365 and then you subtract the 335 let me do that so as I said 335 times 1.09 is 365 and then subtract 335 that's two sig figs there 30 meters per second that's about well, not over 60 miles per hour ish all right now part B what is the frequency that does the person receive as she moves away now so we're going to assume the same velocity it's the same equation but now we're going to use the minus in this so I'm going to use the minus let me write that down and I did all the work here like I say it's minus because in, a case, in this case where the source is stationary and they're moving apart you use the minus and you assume the same velocity of the car same source of the fre frequency source 210 velocity of the wave is 335 so just 335 plus 30 365 divided by 335 uh, um, gives you a number oops I did that, that should be a minus right there I wrote it I did the calculation right that should be a minus right there minus 30 all right so it's 305 divided by 335 is a number like 0.9 something times 210 is 190 you can double check that I believe that's correct so that's Doppler shift equations and we'll move on now to 
Resonance.